to uh, talk to Dr. Alex Mitchell about depression and my first question would be what is depression? It sounds like a simple question what is depression but it's actually quite hard to answer because psychiatrists have tended to define the entity of depression based on certain criteria that we've tended to change over time and in fact there's a major change coming up um, next year in the American Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, but in everyday terms we can say that depression is a persistent state of low mood, usually associated with a loss of interest. That really means that pleasurable activities that you would normally enjoy are not experienced in the same way. Some people say the low mood is distinct from just everyday sadness, that there's a real quality to a clinical depression. Those two symptoms, the low mood and loss of interest, if they're present for, let's say, two weeks or more, that would be a minimum duration that's recommended. Uh, and associated, importantly associated with a decrease in your function, so the mood problem is impairing on your day-to-day -day life, then we'd call that package or syndrome a clinical depression. Although in America they tend to call that major depression. If in total you have those features plus in total five symptoms of depression or more, five or more symptoms. So there's a number of symptoms you have to have, a number of duration, and they've got to impact on your daily life. That's what psychiatrists would usually consider to be a clinical depression. And how common is depression? Well, we're quite um, accurate at that now because we've had large-scale population studies which are called epidemiological studies. Really, these studies involve um, people like you or I going out to the community and knocking on people's doors and asking them questions about what they've been experiencing in the last year, let's say. So if you take um, current depression, which would be present on that day that you go and interview the patient, uh, it's actually only modestly common in the general population. The, the population rate's about 2.5%. Now 2.5% doesn't sound much, but let's take the UK, which has approximately 63 million population. That would mean there's about one and a half million people who are depressed at any one time. And that, that's a considerable burden, you know, for the population as a whole. In addition, I said that's the rate on a particular day, but you could say, well, what's the rate over a year, which is going to be higher, or the rate over your whole lifetime? And it depends how old the person is when you interview the person, but um, the lifetime rates are really significant, even for those coarse, severe clinical depressions. So the lifetime rate, as a rule of thumb, for women is 20%, and for men, 10%, which immediately tells you there's a, a difference of about twofold between men and women, with women being more at risk over their lifetime of experiencing a, a depression, for reasons actually we're not fully clear about even now. And how does being depressed, would you say, impact on someone's daily life? Yeah, that, that is a key question. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that depression can impact upon your life. and. Depression can be mild. In fact, it's important to say that if you put depression on a spectrum by asking people about the common symptoms, as a rule of thumb, about 70% of people have a mild depression, about 20% have a moderate depression, and 10% or less have a severe depression. So mild depressions were once considered to be not very important in medicine. You know, we could let primary care colleagues look after them or even people could manage on their own. We now recognize that because the prevalence, the, the rate of that um, condition is large, even a slight effect on people's lives is going to affect a lot of people in the population. A good way to look at this is how many people are not able to do their normal role because of their depression. If you have depression, how many days out of role would it cause, whether that's work, your, your personal life or um, you know, so, social everyday function. And from uh, the big Spanish national study, which is involving an instrument called PrimeMD, and Alonso was the first author on, on a paper there in 2009, I think it was. They showed that if you have depression, it usually accounted for about 34 days out of role a year. Now that's across all spectrums of depression. If you have a severe depression, it's going to be much more. You know, some people are almost entirely out of their normal, normal role because of depression. Is feeling low the same as feeling depressed? Well, that's actually controversial because we usually reserve the term depression to that package or syndrome that I alluded to before. So uh, essentially feeling low is a symptom. 
Now, some psychiatrists would say, well, is feeling low really even qualifying for depression? Because isn't feeling low just an everyday experience? Now, this is where you've got a group of people, you know, experts who, who believe depression is very much a um, unique kind of uh, disorder, almost a disease, a disease model where those, those symptoms and signs don't occur in the general population except for those with those disease vulnerabilities. And then you've got another group that say, well, no, low mood and depression itself is on a spectrum in the population. Now, if you rate people by symptom or by symptom count or by multiplying severity and symptom count, you definitely get a spectrum of suffering in the population. Um, and it's actually surprising. So, for example, the most common um, rate of symptoms in the population of depression is not none. It's actually one or two symptoms. The, majority, the, the most frequently reported number is one or two symptoms of depression. But that's not normally qualifying. To be qualifying, you have to have you know, five in the American uh, definition and four in the British definition. So to come back to your question, is low mood the same? If low mood um, is significant and it's associated with other symptoms and signs, then it's, it is, in my view, a, a qualifying symptom. Does being depressed imply that you're not coping with your life? I don't like the term not coping because it tends to imply blame to the individual that they must sort out. I mean, it's obvious that if somebody has depression and they are experiencing everyday burden, they are by definition struggling. My view is, what, whose responsibility is that? It's actually shared. So the patient has a responsibility to signal to a relevant authority, a clinician, their GP, that they're struggling and they have those symptoms. But we in the medical profession have a responsibility to pick that up and to try and help the patient. So I don't like that terminology of not coping. And it also implies that depression would be just synonymous with um, personality traits of coping or not coping. And to be honest, you pretty much anyone could experience a clinical depression if you put them under significant stress for long enough, in my opinion. And then if you measured whether they're coping, they wouldn't be coping very well, but that would be a result of being depressed. So I wouldn't like to say that not coping is the cause of depression, if you see what I mean. I do. And what would you say are the most common symptoms of depression? The common symptoms are recognised in the symptom list, which we're advised to use when screening for depression. So we also, also rank these statistically, and they don't conform to the usual list exactly, but they're close. So I'll tell you the symptoms that occur um, in the symptom list that we're meant to be screening with. And those are used in an everyday questionnaire like the patient health questionnaire, nine item version. So the two core symptoms in both the European and American systems are low mood and loss of interest. We mentioned those before. That's joined by another core symptom in the British criteria, which is um, fatigue. In fact, fatigue, poor sleep, and change in appetite or weight are really the next three symptoms which would be a cluster of physical symptoms, somatic symptoms they call them. So somatic symptoms can occur as a direct result of depression. That's joined by the symptom of um, psychomotor change, which actually is a jargon term meaning you feel very agitated or slowed up. Feeling slowed up as an observer rated sign, i.e. your clinician notices it, has special importance because it's very rare in the general population, but it's, it's not common in depression. But if it's there, it has high predictive value, meaning it's a big flag for being depressed. Um, in addition to the symptoms I've mentioned there, another important symptom, which is we don't know, is it really a somatic symptom or psychological symptom, is poor concentration. And then there's the symptom that's sometimes forgotten, feeling um, negative about yourself or that you've done something wrong. We could call that guilt, feeling bad about what might have happened, even if the judgment is erroneous because it's a depression-related cognition. And then the final symptom to mention, to complete the nine, is actually feeling that life's not worth living or feeling suicidal. So those are the typical nine features in the American system that help to diagnose depression. I have to say they're not complete, 
For example, there's one core, in my opinion, core symptom which we looked at and it's statistically important, but uh, it's not in the diagnostic feature list, and that's lack of motivation. Lack of motivation is, is actually a very important feature of depression, but we don't tend to ask about it, or we just subsume it under loss of interest. So those, those are the, the core symptoms of depression. Now you asked another question as well, what was that? That was what causes depression in uh, your opinion? Well that's a big, <laughs> that's, that's, a big one of, that's the hardest one of all to answer because our advanced, you know, eloquent studies that have looked at these very attractive medical causes of depression, are biological entities, new, the neurobiology of depression if you like, and I'm talking there about changes in the brain measured by a chemical test measured by neuroimaging or measured by a proxy such as uh, neuropsychological testing. They're, they're not shown nothing but they've never come up with a diagnostic test which is used every day. So the theories about neurotransmitters, that's chemicals in the brain that could cause depression, in my opinion they're still theories. If only because any abnormality is a slight population shift which is not unique to depression. What we're really looking for there then is something that occurs in depression but only occurs in depression and when it does occur in depression or when it does occur it always causes depression in other words it's a it's a feature that's strongly strongly tied to depression now we don't really know that we only know these um, kind of trends that cause the population to be more at risk so in, in everyday terms the, the things that people think about when they're talking about depression are things like um, being at a disadvantage because of your socio-economic group being under stress at home, I mean a, a good example from the literature in the 70s would be having no good confidant or partner that you can talk to, you know, basically feeling isolated and on your own, that's a big a powerful factor. A catch-22, a circularity, pe fe having de had depression in the past, of course that's one of the strongest risk, risk factors if you can identify it. Having a family history of depression, that's important. Um, there, there are many, many, many causes, but I'd like to simplify all those causes in general terms to say whatever makes that person feel they're under stress or uh, under an oppressive burden from things that they can't easily escape from for a long period of time and they feel they cannot get help and resolve those problems, whatever you put in that, in that category, then I would say those are likely to be causes of depression. So should you get treatment if you are depressed, and, and if you are depressed, could this treatment be non-medication? Definitely. If you are depressed with a clinical depression, I would definitely advise anyone to seek help. And if you don't have success in seeking help from your first outlet, your first GP, persist with it rather than suffer in silence with those symptoms because depression is a persistent relapsing and remitting disorder. I prefer not to call it a chronic disorder because it implies you are very unlikely to come out of that disorder and it's always there. It's more akin to a disorder, well, that's um, there and then treated and likely to come back. So for example, if you're depressed, you've got a, with one episode, one time depression, never depressed before, the chance of a second episode is around about 50 to 60 percent. So there's a high risk, probably more than not being depressed again in the future. And if you have two episodes, it's amplified even further to give you roughly 70% chance of a, um, of a third episode. So it, the risk accumulates with time. But yes, I would definitely advise people to seek treatment. Um, and if they don't have success with that first treatment, they should persist. About two thirds of people will have a very good response um, and enter remission, which means they get well from their first treatment. Um, but there are many other treatment options and I think you asked should they try non-medication options? Well yes, medication yes. and medication options are are available and they've all, they've all got their place so each one should be on the table and the risks and the benefits of each one considered. And how can you recognise if you really are suffering from depression? Well, that's one of the key questions, isn't it? For the individual who's suffering those early symptoms, how do they pick it up? I guess the key thing is that they're struggling day to day with a mood problem, which is affecting their ability to experience um, normal hobbies, interests, relationships and work in the way that they would normally experience it. 
maybe they can recognize that they're looking at certain situations negatively or to look that another way negative situations t seem to reoccur to them disproportionately to them but sometimes it is the effect of the environment stress but sometimes it's the perception of being in a very difficult situation uh, in other words the negative thoughts of depression can become difficult to control and inescapable the other the other key thing i must say is that feeling that life's not worth living or feeling even more that um, you want a way out or you're feeling suicidal that's a red flag for patients and clinicians to say look you know something's not right here um, we need to do something about this so in your opinion should um, people seek treatment if they're depressed and should they then think well this could work for me definitely the definitely people should seek help for depression if they're depressed that's that's in a way the most important message i can give to the general public watching this that you should you should seek help i mean i will be honest and say i recognize problems can occur during that process but um more and more clinicians are recognizing mental health as a valid medical concern that warrants an intervention and now we have guidance that's clear on what to do about it and how to recognize it we do have screening tools that means that the clinicians even gps who are very busy with lots of other problem areas can um, ask relevant questions about depression and when depression is spotted we do have treatments that work effectively for the vast majority of people um, i would say that in my clinical practice I can't remember a patient with depression that I've not been able to significantly help and the vast, vast majority of people that I've seen, I mean over 90%, get well from the episode of depression. So if you're depressed at the current time and watching this, if you see a good clinician, in my opinion, and it's pretty much there in the literature as well, there's a 90% or higher chance you will be well again in the near future. And that's the key message, because when you're depressed, you often feel you're stuck in that for a long period. It almost feels like you've never not been depressed when it's been going on months. And so seeking help and persisting with seeking help from an appropriate person it is, is critical. I think that is the key factor of our talk today, that if anyone watching this is depressed out there, there's a real need to seek help and that help will be there and available. Definitely. Thank you very much for talking to us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.